we are so thankful as we begin to remember what took place more than 2,000 years ago. This week, Passion Week, Lord, the, the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. And, and Lord, we know that Hosanna means save us now. And so, Father, even this morning in this place, we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of a King. And so we cry out to you this morning, Lord, save us, God. Save us, Lord. We honor you. We love you. We surrender our lives to you. We are desperately in need of a Savior. And we are so grateful that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we know you, that we have a relationship with you, that we can walk with you, that we can hear your voice. There is truly none like you. This morning, I pray, Father, that you would, you would come into the service. Do whatever you desire, Father. Have your way in each and every one of our lives, and we will always give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may take your seats. Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you all this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's warming up in Florida, and um, just really excited about so many things going on here at Oceans. Just a couple of things before I begin this morning. <clears throat> As you heard, we, have, we made an announcement about musicians. We are really in need of a piano player, some more guitar players, and you know, if you play like the cello or the violin or something like that, don't hide your wonderful talents and gifts. Please come out and be a part of the, the, you know, the growing band that we have. And we have so many things coming here at Oceans. We're going to be in need of more musicians. So, so please come out, sign up at the, at the lobby. You know, um, I'm looking to see if I can see any of you sitting out there that you know, have these amazing, amazing talents. Our worship team is doing such a good job. I'm so proud of the guys. Amen. And, um, um, you know, we have a lot of things going on right now and um, you know just kind of like wanted to just touch base with you this week on Friday we have our Good Friday service uh, when, when we came when we came to Vero Beach nine years ago and planted the church uh, there was no Good Friday services and uh, you know I came from from Africa and you know Good Friday was like the most church day in the world you know, I don't know if you're aware of that, but outside of the United States, Good Friday has the highest attended church day in the, in the calendar year, all over the world, only here. So I thought, you know, everyone's going to come to church on Good Friday morning. And I think we had four people that showed up, four people. And I just want you to know, I preached my heart out, even for four. It was awesome. Amen. But... Um, <laughs> It was amazing that, you know, from there on, we, we started doing it every year, and it's grown and grown, and, you know, we have our, our Good Friday service now at night, you know, because people go to work on Good Friday, and I'm going to be honest, I was very surprised by that, to be totally honest. So, you know, I, I want to invite you out, you know, on, on Friday at 7 p.m., it's a sacred service. It's the service once a year where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. It's a, a communion service. So it's a, just a holy time where we come together, remember the sacrifice, we take the communion together. It's a powerful, beautiful service. We'd love to have you come out. If you can't come out, don't worry, we won't condemn you or anything like that, but we would love for you to come. It's gonna be a special evening. As they said, no Saturday night service because of that. And then obviously on Sunday morning, we have very special Easter services planned. Bring your family and your friends. It's a wonderful evangelistic opportunity. As you can see, we've extended the stage because we're going to be doing all kinds of special things. So it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful morning. Also just wanted to just touch base with you regarding the building fund. I know two weeks ago, I kind of dropped a bomb, you know, here at the church. And um, I just, I want, to, I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to so many of you that have absolutely responded. And we're just so grateful, you know, for the... The support and, and, you know, just the, the, you know, some of you are just so, so eager to get behind what God is doing here at Oceans. Uh, just to give you a little bit more information, because I know we tell people to scan the QR code if you want more information. I have a team, Kevin West, who's our treasurer, 
and Doug Marine is on our fundraising committee and he's doing such a fantastic job. Both of them really are. Um, if you, thank you. If you haven't scanned the QR code, maybe it's just not your thing, maybe you don't do the scanning thing, but you like want more information because like Pastor Alex, you dropped this bomb on us, but we need more information. Please contact the church and one of us will call you. Either Kevin, uh, Doug or myself will get in contact with you to give you more information about what's going on. I need you to know that if we don't purchase the mall in the next few months, we will be leaving the mall. Okay? That's for sure. Amen. <laughs> so, so, so it's going to be one or the two. And I'm not saying that in any way to, to, to frighten you, but that's why we had to get the building fund going because we have to start saving so that we can, we can um, you know, move towards either purchasing another facility, building, or purchasing them all. Obviously, you know, anyway. All right, let's move on. So that's where we are. And again, please, guys, feel free to contact us. We will be happy to talk to you and give you more information. In May, we have Vision Sunday. And if I had Vision Sunday now, everybody would be over the moon excited because the vision and the plans that God has for our church is so exciting. And um, I really cannot wait to do that with you. But there's so many exciting things going on that in order for us to prepare properly for it, it's going to take some time. And that's why we haven't done it before. We were put in a position where we had to make this decision because of the time crunch. And that's why we did it now. I would have much rather done that announcement after May, after Vision Sunday. But it didn't work out that way. Amen. So this week is Passion Week. And this is the week, this is the day that Jesus drove into Jerusalem or rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's called the triumphant entry. And he came into Jerusalem and the Bible tells us if you study the different gospels, you'll get the full picture of what happened. But actually the disciples, his disciples or his followers began to put palm branches and put their robes down and cry out, Hosanna in the highest and it was an incredible moment. The whole city heard it. They all began to come over. The religious people came, came over, and they were all listening to this. And, and, and prophecy was being fulfilled as Jesus entered Jerusalem. It's an extremely powerful time in the life of Jesus. And if you study Scripture, there's an incredible amount that took place between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. There's a whole lot that take, takes place. And I want to encourage you to go and study it. Even the teachings that Jesus did, the majority of teachings that took place after Palm Sunday happened in one day. And you'll find that Jesus did an incredible amount of teaching. How many of you think the teachings that Jesus make just before he goes to the cross might be important? Amen. So I encourage you to go and listen to it. I wanted to teach on that, but the Lord had me go in a different direction. So I'm not going to be teaching on that this morning, but thank the Lord you all have Bibles, Amen. and you can go read about it, and read your Bible, pray every day. Have you heard that song? Okay. I'm so glad you're all so excited. <laughs> and it goes like this, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Okay? Have you, do you know that song? Okay, I'm going to ask Joey to sing it to us next week. Okay, Joey, wherever you are, you need to learn that song. All right, this week, I really believe the Lord has put this message on my heart because I really believe that this is where we are as a church. And when I say as a church, I'm not talking about oceans, I'm talking about the church. This message this morning, I believe, is so important for us to fully grasp you know, Jesus spoke to us about being salt and light. And this morning, I want to teach you about the light, about being the light of the world. How many of you know that Jesus referred to himself as light, and then he referred to you and I as light? What's interesting is he calls us salt as well. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't refer to himself as a, ever as salt. Only us he refers to as salt. And there's a whole teaching on that that I'm going to do in a few weeks from now. But this morning I want to stay focused primarily on light because I think it's so important for us to understand how important it is for us to be true light. 
Now, the interesting thing about light is that it does two primary things. When you turn the light on, it exposes everything. How many of you know you walk into a dark room, you can see nothing, you put the lights on, and everything that's in that room gets exposed. What you must understand is that you are filled with light, and when you step into the world, which whether we believe it or not is not good, the culture and the things going on in the world are not good, what's in the dark is not going to like the light. So you may not be popular if you carry the light. And this is important for us to understand because the truth is if we are light bearers, we have to be different to what's darkness. And understand that when you carry light, you will expose the darkness. That's just what's going to happen. The other thing that light does is it shows us the way. It, it reveals to us the way we should go. How many of you know if you're ever walking in the dark and you have a torch, you're shining the torch, you can see the way that you should go. So light reveals the way that we should go. As believers carrying light, we're going to expose darkness and also show people the way that they should go. The interesting thing about light is that we need to understand what our role is when it comes to bearing light. And it's so important that we fully grasp that. Now remember, I said to you that Jesus didn't refer to himself as salt, but he referred to himself as light. He also referred to us as light. But he only refers to himself as light one time in Scripture. And what's really important is you see where he does it. Because the context is so important. In understanding why Jesus refers to him as light after a specific incident that takes place will help us understand better what us being light should mean. How many of you believe that's true? Context in Scripture is so important. Now, I'm going to show you in the Bible where Jesus refers to himself as light and what took place just before he does that, and it's going to shock you if you don't like really know the Bible very well, if you don't know the story already. So let's go in our Bibles this morning together to John 8, verse number 1. And I'm excited. I'm excited to share this with you because I think it's so powerful. John 8, verse number 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down and taught them, and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And Jesus said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Wow, what a powerful, powerful story. I want to kind of break this down for you because it's important for us to understand this because it's right after this that Jesus refers to himself as being light. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that the Pharisees had a strategy. They had, they had a strategy because we know this because the Bible teaches us that they were testing him they were going to test him, and they'd found this woman in adultery and brought this woman to Jesus. And so there was an absolute plan to try and trap Jesus. Now, let's read this text and break it down, because I need you to see something very powerful. 
The first thing I want you to understand is how many of you know that he is the word? So they're coming to Jesus to test him with the word. So if we go to verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, if we go to verse 4, let's go to John 8 verse 4. So they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us, this is a command now, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So now they're testing the word, they're testing the word, they're testing the law <laughs> with the law. And they want to they corner him so that they can see him do something wrong so that they can frame him or, or accuse him. Are you guys with me? Now, in order for, to, for us to understand the context of this, let's go look at the law. What does the law say about someone caught in adultery? And please don't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. Leviticus 20 verse 10. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and adulteress shall surely be put to death. It's plain and simple. It's, it's true. What they're saying was accurate. If you were caught in adultery, you were to be put to death. But I need you to understand something. It's not as cut and dry as you think. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. God didn't just decide that, listen, it's a good idea. If they do something, they're not supposed to just kill them. That's not how it is. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die, the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away, here's the reason, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. You must understand that all God is trying to do is to protect his people from what? Evil. You see, the enemy wants to come into the camp. And the way that he can come into the camp is by coming in where he's given legal ground. These are God's covenant people, and there are covenants that he puts in place for protection, for blessing, for provision. How many of you know that's true? So when the covenant is broken, when the law is broken, then there's legal ground. So God wants to, this is a serious offense. So because God wants to keep the camp pure for, and, and pre prevent the enemy from coming in, he wants to cut it off. You see, we could get very technical now and talk about sins down the bloodline and how it affects you and what happens when someone enters into a sin and enters into agreement with a spirit and all kinds of things, but I don't want to do that. Is that okay? You need to understand, though, that God doesn't just want to spoil your fun. That's not his intentions. It shouldn't be fun for you anyway. Okay, let's just move on. Okay. <laughs> Man, it's fun to be a pastor. So we understand the accusation. We understand that the accusation actually has justification. Are you guys with me? But I want you to see how Jesus handles this. Let's go back to John 8. We'll pick it up in verse number six. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. It's interesting. So now they're saying to Jesus, what do you say? It says in the law of Moses that they must be put to death. What do you say, Jesus? Jesus pretends he's not listening to them, and he begins to write with his finger on the ground. Now, I have heard multiple explanations of what this could potentially mean. And I need to be clear. This this that I'm about to share with you are different things that it could be. There's no, we don't know. We don't know for sure. I heard that someone was trying to take, that Jesus was trying to take the attention off the woman. That's possible. I've heard that Jesus was writing, you know, the law down on, 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 the, on the ground. That's possible. Again, we weren't there and the Bible doesn't tell us. So we don't know for sure. The one explanation that I kind of lean a little bit towards, but please, this is just my opinion, it doesn't really count for much in this situation, is that while he was writing this, and you'll understand why I say this in just a moment, is that he, this, he is the law. <laughs> he is the word, and he's writing it, and it's almost like you guys just don't get it. 
You're telling me what should I do about the law? I know the law, and he's writing it because when in Scripture we see a finger writing, and every time we see a finger write in Scripture, it's the finger of God. So that's kind of why I feel it could be that. Now watch this, because this is where it gets really interesting. So it says, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. Now, I need you to just pause for a moment because understand he was challenged with the law. So what Jesus is doing and what most of us don't realize because we don't, we don't know the law, we don't know the law well, is he's actually busy challenging them with the law. But you see, in our mind, we think that when Jesus says, listen, if you have no sin, throw a stone. You can throw a stone. That's actually not what he's saying. Let's take a look at what the law says. Let's go to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. This is so good. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. I'm going to read to you the law. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. Stop for a moment. Everybody look at me. Jesus is saying, listen, if you have no sin, you can throw the first stone. But he's referring to the sin of adultery. Because in the law, if you were doing other sins, you could stone her. But if you were doing the same type of sin, you had no right to stone. You must understand, they're challenging him with the law. The only way that he can achieve what the law truly says is by quoting the law. So he says, if you are without sin, what sin? The same sin, you can throw the stone. And look how nicely the Bible puts it. From the oldest, even down to the least, they were convicted and couldn't throw a stone, so they walked away. See, it's not always how much knowledge you have. Man, the last, the first service enjoyed this a whole lot more than you guys. Okay? Guys, this is so powerful because everything about what they're doing is just so bad. They wanna kill this woman, they wanna frame Jesus and Jesus is using the law. We think the law is so terrible. Jesus is using the law to protect her. Okay, now watch, because it gets better. Let's go back to John 8. Let's pick it up again in John 8, verse 8. And again, he stooped down, wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by this conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Now watch, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, and when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, why is this so important? Because again, he's using the law. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Are you guys with me? I know we're kind of jumping back and forth, but it's important for you to see what he's busy doing. Deuteronomy 19.15, the same scripture. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. Now watch. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. What has he done? The witnesses are gone. Why are they gone? Because they're not innocent. So they cannot make an accusation against her. And so what happens is he's using the law to set her free. This is so good. This is so good. 
So these religious leaders that were so self-righteous couldn't accuse her because they were doing the same thing. And then according to the law, it has to be by the, by the witness of at least two or three that it shall be established. There was no witnesses left. So Jesus said to her, where are your accusers? And I can only imagine the moment that this woman caught in adultery must have been filled with shame said to him, Lord, there's no one. Then he says, well, I don't condemn you either. And then listen to me. Everybody look at me, pay attention. Then she gets up and he says to her, keep on sinning. Don't worry about it, you're under grace now. You can be ugly and do something about it, but stupid is forever, guys. What does the Bible say? Jesus never agreed with her sin. He understood the cost of the sin. He understood the danger of the sin. So what does he tell her? Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. You think the law is there to, to make it hard and to make it painful? No, the law is there to protect you. That's why the law was there. Now, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But I need you to just see our God has never changed. And oh, he doesn't agree with sin because even there he says to her, listen, go and sin no more. But what has she encountered? What has she just encountered? Let me tell you what she's encountered. She's encountered light. She was in darkness and the religious kept her in darkness and wanted to condemn her. But then she encountered light. She encountered love. She encountered our God. Are you guys with me? It's so powerful. Now watch. So we see how Jesus uses the law to reveal the heart of God and set her free. And quite frankly, he put them to shame, the Pharisee. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> let's read verse. Let's read verse 11 again. John 8 verse 11. And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again. This is preceding that event. Saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Man, this is, this is packed. This is loaded. He who follows me, follows me, does what I do, follows my example, follows my leading. He who chooses to follow me, let's do it. His way. Come on, let's do it His way. See, you can be religious. You can know the rules and regulations. But what type of a heart do you have? Do you have a heart that releases light and freedom and blessing? No. You must understand something. Many will go, well, you know, you know I agree with Jesus. I think that it's fine. We, you know, we can just do what we want, live how we want. Listen, light exposes darkness, guys. The sin was exposed, but he didn't shun or condemn her. You see, light is not there to break someone down. Light is not there to reject someone. Light is there to attract someone to the light, to bring them out of darkness. The Bible says that where the light shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot comprehend it. It cannot withstand it. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, they were mad now, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Watch here now. You judge according to the flesh. And how many of us, thinking we're doing what's right, is judging and walking according to the flesh? And we go around as Christians, light bearers, but the light that's shining out of us is just like the Pharisees. And oftentimes we're guilty of the same sins that we are condemning. 
You see, the truth is, is that if you really are a light bearer, you will come up out of that darkness. I'm not telling you it's okay to walk in sin. It's not. You have to be different. You can't conform to the culture. Because you see, what makes you different is what, what reveals the light. You can't submit to the things of this world. I was telling the, the group in the, in the first service, I, I, I've spoken on the subject of social media so many times about how we on social media should be cautious with our words, because the world is watching you. How do I know this? It happened to us. We were in a school in Jensen Beach, and we invited someone to church, and the lady said to us, I won't go to church because I watch you Christians fight online and criticize each other online. What kind of light is that? We're supposed to be different. Our morals, our standards are supposed to be higher. Does that mean that we think better of ourselves? We think more of ourselves? Did Jesus ever hold himself? Look at me. I'm the son of God. He was lowly. He was meek. He was humble. And he, he could sit in the room with anybody. But yet some of us, oh, you know, that sinner, you know. I, won't, I can't be around that person. Or, well, you know, Pastor Alex, you know, bad company corrupts good character. That's talking about a Christian, not an unbeliever. I'm not saying you must go hang out in bars and stuff unless you're there for the right reason. And if you are hanging out in bars, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Some, look, you know, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Listen, I picked on adultery a minute ago. Now we're going to go for, okay, just stop. Okay. What I'm trying to tell you guys is that we are supposed to come up out of this and we are supposed to be light, not by what we say. Let's take a look at what that scripture says. Let me read it finished real quick. Let's quickly go to Matthew 5.14. When Jesus tells us to be the light, look at what he says. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now watch. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is not for them to see all the stuff that you do. I give money, I take care of the poor, I do this. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about seeing you in your life, how you conduct yourself, how you, how you, how you operate your business, how you take care of your family, how you talk to your family, how you talk to your employees, how you live your life. What type of good works are you putting out? Is it light or is it darkness? Because the Bible says, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So when Jesus was standing with that woman and the religious was busy wanting her to be put to death, he said, listen, I'm the light. I know the law. And mercy triumphs over judgment, guys. If you wanna lead someone to Christ, if you wanna be light, we need to do it in a way that we can show that light not by what we say, but by how we live our lives. And yes, by what we say too. The way we conduct ourselves. You are held to a higher standard. You are, you are redeemed. You are saved. You have tasted the heavenly gift. You've been given life and life abundant. You cannot look the same as the world. You cannot. If you do, you will make no difference to anybody. If you don't like it, this isn't the church for you. I'm sorry. And I want you to stay here because I like you. But that doesn't mean that I can agree with what's wrong. I can't. Because we have to be different. If we want to change our community, they must, be, they must want to come to the light. And, and in this age right now, this message is so important for the church. Because the culture is going in one way and we think that that's normal. There is nothing normal about it. 
The road that leads to death is wide. The road that leads to life is narrow. The gate is narrow. It means you have to be different. You have to make a stand, guys. You have to really be different to be light. And I believe that God is calling us to be light. Here's the good news. I believe that the woman caught in adultery became light. And I believe she became light because she met the Lord. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, I'm, what I mean is she really met him. And, and we know she did. You see, sometimes we judge God's character on what we see. I, I do the best I can, but please, I'm not your example. But you have to understand that, that they are watching you. The world is watching you. So you have to be a good example. And when that love and that mercy is shining out, then our children, our neighbors, the people at our business, they will run to Jesus. And we will see transformation happen. You know, you might be sitting here and saying, well, you know, I haven't been light. I understand. Maybe you, the woman caught in adultery. Maybe it's something completely different, but you know you've kind of gone away. The good news is that Mercy triumphs over judgment. You can't do anything about yesterday, but that's why we, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Does it give you a license to carry on doing that? No. Stop, or else you're gonna end up getting into trouble. God wants the evil out the camp. We understand spiritual warfare. The guys in the Old Testament, they didn't understand it the way we do. They didn't. They only even had a concept of the devil much later in the Old Testament. We know this because there are books in the Bible that one says God, one says Satan, because their understanding wasn't there yet. So spiritual warfare and understanding and revelation of that is a newer thing. Yes, they knew that there was dark forces, they knew all of that, but they didn't understand it the way we do. So God has been planning everything perfectly for your well-being for your benefit, because he loves you. Not to spoil it for you guys. It's time for us, if we're the church, the true church, to come out of the darkness and to be different and to let our light shine. Well, you know, that guy, he's weird, perfect. That's exactly right, I'm finally getting somewhere. What is normal anyway? What they call normal today, really? Five years ago, if you called what today is considered normal five years ago, you would have said that person is a freak. So don't measure yourself to what the world says. Measure yourself to the word of God. What's our standard? His word is our standard. And my prayer for you this morning is number one, if you're struggling, that you'll run to the light. My second prayer for you this morning is that if you're, if you're a believer and walking with him, it's time for us to be that light and hold ourselves to a higher standard, not self-righteously, but humbly, because the only way we can stay there is because of the grace of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, this morning in this place, I'm so grateful, Lord, for each and every person in this house this morning. Father, all of us have a different story and we're all at different places, but you know exactly where we are. Just like that day with a woman caught in adultery, it was her moment of visitation, what was the worst experience the shameful experience, how they trapped her and everything, ended up being her greatest moment where she met with you, Jesus. 
I pray this morning, Father, that we would be like that, that we would take even this morning as an opportunity to come out of darkness. Father, I pray this morning for every person in this place, maybe watching online, that has been in a place where they, they just, they just have, they're tired, they've had enough, Lord, and now they've choose to run to Jesus. So this morning, if you've come here, I wanna ask you, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, I want you to know that just like that woman caught in adultery, you can give your life to him and come out of the darkness. It doesn't have to be adultery. It can be anything. You know, the truth is no one has to tell a sinner how bad they are because we all know we're bad. I know I'm bad. But his grace is sufficient and he's calling you out. He wants to touch you. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to bring you out of that shame. He wants to bring you out of that darkness and he wants to touch you with his love and his mercy and his grace. If you've come here this morning and you say, Pastor Alex, that's me. I wanna give my heart to Jesus this morning. Lift your hand up so I can pray for you. Don't be afraid. Just quickly slip your hand up and I'll pray for you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else say, Pastor, that's me this morning. Raise your hand up and I'll pray for you. Don't be afraid. Amen. If you've come here this morning and you say, Pastor Alex, I used to serve the Lord, but when you speak about coming out of this, coming out and being true light, I feel like I've, I've lost my way, I've lost that light. And I've kind of been compromising with the world and sort of one foot in the world, one foot in the church. I need to recommit my heart to Jesus. I wanna rededicate my life to him. I wanna be light for him this morning. If that's you and you say, Pastor, I also want to recommit my heart to Jesus this morning. Raise your hand and I'll include you in that prayer. God bless you. God bless you over there. Thank you so much. God bless you over there. Thank you, young lady. Just raise your hand so I can see. Just raise it high so I can see where you are. God bless you. Thank you. Last call. If any one of those things is you, if you say, I need to run to Jesus today or I need to become light for him, I've lost my way, raise your hand up. I'll include you in this prayer. Last call. Last call. I see your hand, God bless you, thank you so much. If you raised your hand, can I ask you, I see your hand, thank you. If, I, if you raised your hand, please stand up. Please don't be afraid, please stand up. Come on church, let's give them a big round of applause. Stand up sir, stand up. God bless you guys, thank you, God bless you. Can I ask you if you're standing, come to me quickly. Come to me, come, come I wanna pray for you. God bless you guys. Come, don't be afraid. This is the most important decision you'll ever make. If you stood up or if you raised your hand, come and stand here. Thank you. Come, man. Come stand over here. Come stand right here. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you guys, man. God bless you. Hey, just stand right over here. Thank you so much. There we go. Come stand here. You are so welcome. Stand right here. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you guys. Now, listen, there were more hands, and I, I don't want to point you out, but I want you, we can, I'm going to pray with these in the front in fact, we're all gonna pray. And if you raised your hand in the back, I want you to participate with us in this prayer. You see, the thing is that we have to be able to confess him. You know, that's what it says. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray a prayer and invite the Lord into our hearts this morning. Your life will never be the same again, hey? Never the same, never the same. And I wanna ask you this morning to do that. Make a decision to invite the Lord in. And guys, walking with Jesus is the most wonderful, exciting adventure. It's, it's, it's not perfect because we live in this world, but, but walking with him just changes everything. So I, I, wanna, I wanna ask you, and for those of you that, that are out there that didn't come forward, and, but let's all pray this together. Let's pray this from our hearts, okay? Let's say, Father, I come to you today. I believe Jesus died and rose again. He's the Son of God. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me in your blood. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, today I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray for these standing here and even those that that raised their hands that didn't come forward, Father, that you would meet with them this morning, that their lives would never be the same. Young lady, everything is changing. Everything is changing. Like that, like that story I shared this morning, you're coming out of darkness and God's gonna really touch your life. 
and you will become light. You will become great light. That light will shine in each and every one of you. You will never be the same again. Your walk is going to go from one level to another level, completely new level. And I thank you for these precious people, Father, this precious young man. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you guys take a look over there is Pastor Brian. If you can just follow him out. There's somebody behind you that wants to meet you and pray with you. You can just go down there. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Are we going to be light? Amen. Amen. Let me bless you guys. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, leading us, and teaching us. I pray now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of these precious ones that are yours, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in his peace. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you on Friday night.